Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the final in this year's Classical Association of Manchester and the, the regional area uh, branch. And this is our final talk of the 2021-2 year. Um, but welcome uh, to this evening. And we are very honoured to welcome Dr Joe Stoner, who um, I know quite well from recent research projects. And she's joining us this evening uh, as an expert in classical Roman archaeology and history and has a, a wealth of experience and ongoing research dealing with artefacts from the Roman and late antique periods of Egypt, uh, which is crucial in developing our understanding of archaeological and environmental contexts uh, for artefacts and their functions and meanings in past societies. Um, her 2019 monograph published with Leiden Brill is entitled The Cultural Lives of Domestic Objects in Late Antiquity. And it presents a valuable and unique contribution to the field, as I'm sure those of you who've read it and used it will be aware. Uh, Joe also worked with myself and Ellen Swift on our recent project with the UCL uh, Petri Museum, a topic about which she's going to talk to us this evening uh, with her paper, Red in Roman Egypt, Researching Personal Objects in the UCL Petri Museum. So I'll hand straight over to you, Joe. Lovely. Thanks very much, April. Um, I will share my screen. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so thank you very much, April. Um, as April um, just said, my talk this evening is based on uh, the research that um, I conducted um, as part of the AHRC funded project, Roman and Late Antique Artifacts from Egypt, Understanding Society and Culture. So this project was a collaboration between the University of Kent, Manchester Metropolitan University, and um, as my title suggests, the UCL Petrie Museum of Egyptian Archaeology in London. So I was lucky enough to work alongside Professor Ellen Swift from Kent, and of course, Dr. April Pudsey, who's kindly invited me here today. And again, thank you, very excited to be here. Um, so the aim of this project was to investigate social experience in Roman and late antique Egypt. And this was done via the study of artifacts. So by assessing details such as materials, wear, repair and modification of Roman possessions, we sought oh, to I demonstrate... Oh, I forgot about that. Do you mind if I... Sorry, do you mind if I listen to this? <laughs> So, oh. I'm sorry, Joe, could you unmute yourself? Sorry about that mistake there. Okay, no worries. Right, I'll, I'll just, so we're, okay, cool. Um, yeah, so as I said, uh, the aim of the project was to experience social, ex to investigate social experience in Roman and late antique Egypt um, via the study of artifacts specifically. So we were assessing details such as materials, wear, repair and modification of Roman possessions. And through this, we sought to demonstrate the role objects held in everyday experiences in Roman Egypt. Now, the work that I'm presenting uh, this evening um, is just one um, small element of what was a much broader project. So we covered um, topics including dress objects, textile tools, children's material culture, um, and also sound making objects. And all of this work um, culminated in, firstly, um, a temporary exhibition at the Petri Museum. So this is a photo of it on the right. And that was all to do with our work on um, sound making objects and instruments. And excitingly, um, in November last year, we published our co-authored book. Um, and so this is all the findings from our research project. So published with um, Oxford University Press, The Social Archaeology of Roman and Late Antique Egypt. In terms of this evening's topic, I do appreciate that the sound of a paper on the colour red in artefacts sounds quite broad. Um, however, it was through time spent handling the artefacts within the Petrie Museum collection that it became clear to me that there was a significant cultural value assigned to this colour within certain contexts of use and also certain artefact categories. 
So as a result, um, I'm going to show that the study of these objects can in fact tell us a lot of valuable information about ordinary people in late antique and Roman Egypt, specifically in terms of their beliefs, their behaviours and their cultural practices. So um, the route that I intend to take over the next 40 minutes or, or so um, is going to be starting off with the background to the Petrie Museum and its collection. And I think it's important to go over this um, because we need to have an understanding of the unique nature of the Petrie Museum's collection um, to understand some of the challenges that we faced as researchers when we were doing um, our research. Um, and I think it also underlines the real amazing opportunities that this sort of material um, can offer researchers. Um, and the, the museum collection was just so central to the project that I'd really like to show you some good pictures as well. Um, then we'll move on to um, the, main, the main bulk of um, the talk on red, the colour red, um, specifically in terms of artefacts. So I'll be talking briefly about organic materials and also dyes and pigments. Um, and then we'll look at some examples from um, the museum, so string jewellery and amulets, um, as well as shoes and sandals. And then I'll finish up with some concluding thoughts. So as I stated a moment ago, um, the overarching aim of this two year project, project was to research social experience via direct study of Roman and late antique artefacts from Egypt as kept in the collections of the UCL Petrie Museum of Egyptian Archaeology. So the Petrie Museum itself is tucked down a side street in Bloomsbury, um, London, in the heart of um, the UCL area. Um, and it's a historic collection of artefacts that have been excavated from Egypt and Sudan. So this underrated collection contains over 8,000 objects that span the Roman and late antique periods. So the bulk of the Petrie Museum's collection came from excavations that were carried out by the archaeologist Flinders Petrie at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. So you can see he's this gentleman up here in the top right. So alongside artefacts from um, the digs that he led, the collection is also formed um, from that of one of his sponsors and the co-founder of the Egypt Exploration Society, Amelia Edwards. And she received many um, fines from these excavations um, from the turn of the century. Um, and this was in return for her kind of patronage and support. So it's important at this point to note that not all the fines from each excavation by Petrie and his colleagues are housed in the Petrie Museum. So instead, during this period, the practice was to distribute fines to a variety of different institutions. So museums, universities, um, in galleries across Britain, Europe and the wider world. So at this point, for anyone who's interested in looking into this sort of material, I really want to mention the website Artifacts of Excavation. So we've got the uh, web page just there. So this is another research project which studies the archival material which relates to these early British excavations in Egypt. And it's a really invaluable resource for anyone who needs to trace the movement of these artefacts. So, for example, artefacts within an excavation report um, might be missing from within the Petrie Museum collection. So it was an excavation by Petrie, but the material within the publication are not in the museum. So we can use this website to track down what institution those finds were actually distributed to. So UCL took ownership of the Petrie Museum collection in 1915, and it, the collection continued to grow, um, fed by further excavations. So one example um, are the excavations led by Guy Brunton. Um, oh. so he's the fellow, he's having a nice little nap um, at the bottom of the screen. Um, so his digs, for example, at Bat Matmar, um, produced a lot of the Roman and late antique material that we studied um, in this project. So this um, nature of the collections at the Petrie Museum can make it very difficult to fully understand the provenance of the objects that are within it. So for the Roman artefacts that we studied, um, sometimes there are no sites recorded at all, or we might be given very vague dates, very broad, so Roman to late Roman, something like that. 
Furthermore, the objects that do have sites assigned to them um, are not always included in the corresponding published excavation reports. So this makes it incredibly hard to identify dates and contexts when they're not, they're, they're not part of the published material. Another issue was that um, Petrie himself was also fond of acquiring artifacts from local antiquity dealers um, in Egypt. So these usually came without any provenance at all, or they were told they were described as being from a certain site, but there was no guarantee that they were from that site. So these artifacts that were purchased were also subsumed into the Petrie collection, alongside other donations from private collectors. So all in all, that means that finding the original source for many of the artifacts in the Petrie Museum collection can be almost impossible to reconstruct. And this, this situation was also um, exacerbated, to, um, exacerbated by a general historic disinterest in the Roman period. So Petrie himself was predominantly interested in material from dynastic Egypt, so much earlier than the Roman period. And whilst contextual information was recorded um, from Petrie's digs and the quality of it was sometimes ahead of its time, took great interest in things like um, objects of everyday life, which generally traditionally weren't of much scholarly interest. Um, so despite this, we do find that Roman finds in particular um, suffer from greater neglect in terms of the recorded information and the surrounding archival material, because it basically wasn't, it wasn't really the reason that Petrie was digging at these sites. Now, having said all that, some sites, so we have the cemetery at Cow, um, these can be relatively well recorded. And there are systems in place, such as um, using tomb cards. So we can see a picture here. So there's a collection of tomb cards um, that were used to record finds from graves in a kind of methodical manner um, at the site of Cow. These are still within um, the Petrie Museum's archives and they were really invaluable in us finding out um, more details about some of the, the artifacts that we were researching. So it isn't all bad news. I don't wanna be overly pessimistic. So hopefully that gives you some idea of um, some of the problems that we faced when we were researching these artefacts. Um, and we did endeavour to either confirm or correct um, dates for any artefacts that we were studying as far as possible. So we looked at comparative material um, from elsewhere or um, ideally um, recent well-dated excavations, so, although that's not always possible, of course. So now I've given you kind of idea of what the Petrie collection um, is like in terms of its history. Um, I think we can move on to um, looking more at the, the collection in more, more detail. So for six months, I spent every Monday and Tuesday in the Petrie Museum, and I was examining a wide range of artefacts. And during my time um, looking at this material, it became clear that some of these objects had never been studied with any real intent before. So we found that they were often in original packing material from the site. Um, so we've got some examples here. So here we've got um, a collection of broken wooden rings with kind of textile fragments adhering. These have been dated, um, the museum date is Roman. So we don't know what they are. They've not been studied before, but we think they're probably likely to be curtain rings and then used as part of a burial shroud within a grave context. Um, but again, there's no information on this material. You kind of have to, to look at it on its own and try and figure out what's going on. And then we've got some great examples here of the original packing material. So I just really wanted to show you these. I think it's quite, it's quite interesting. So we've got some Roman beads that are in the original matchbox from the excavation sites. Um, so that's what they were placed into, presumably, um, by the excavators. And then here on the right, we have um, a kind of, a, I think it's a bone, uh, kind of tube, so a bit like a box. <clears throat> and it's wrapped up in um, a page of the Times newspaper from 1923. So there's real layers of history that are, are existing when you're looking at this material um, within the Petrie Museum collection. So the more um, of these objects that I studied, the more I became drawn to discrete object groups for closer um, investigation in terms of social experience. And many of these objects were, importantly, um, made from organic materials. 
And I think organic materials is, is key to a lot of the research we conducted on this project. So the landscape and the climate of Egypt allows the survival of wood, leather, wool and linen. So plant materials and animal fibres, things like that. So these are materials that generally perish in the wetter climates elsewhere within the Roman Empire. And we see that the collection of the Petri Museum contains quite a lot of these artefacts. We've got textiles, we've got original, original string and spun thread. We've got leather in terms of shoes and other artefacts and also wooden tools. So these are really valuable examples um, of the kinds of material culture that are now missing from elsewhere in the empire in terms of the archeological record. Furthermore, if we're thinking about color, if we've got surviving organic materials such as textile or animal fibers, then there's usually the opportunity to identify where there's any color surviving on them, either through dye or other pigments. And that is exactly what I started to notice. So in particular for items of jewellery, um, which still retained string elements to them, um, the colour that was being used often to me seemed to be red. So obviously I needed to investigate this further. So I conducted a survey of um, surviving string in artefacts. Um, so I looked firstly at the function of the string and I also looked at the colours that were present. So through this data set, I hope to identify any trends in the use of colour, specifically red. So as a result, um, I collated a data set of 83 objects from the Petri Museum. And these were objects that um, featured original string, cordage or other kind of thread like structures. So this was supplemented with an additional 17 artifacts. And these came from the British Museum and also the Metropolitan Museum of Art um, in New York. So both of those have got excellent online collections. So that gave me a total of a hundred string or part string um, objects that I could then investigate more closely. So as I mentioned before, the dates um, provided by museums um, for artifacts can often be a bit off. Um, they might need a revision um, depending on what kind of artifact they are, um, how they were acquired and um, how well studied they are. So those that um, I selected from the Petrie Museum were broadly dated as Roman, late Roman or Byzantine. Um, however, wherever possible, as I said earlier, I tried to confirm or correct these dates through comparative material and other excavation reports. So interestingly, the dates that we did end up changing um, they were often moving um, later chronologically than um, the initial museum date provided. So they were often more likely to be Byzantine rather than proper Roman period artifacts. So as I said, um, I looked to identify both color and function from the artifacts in my string data set. And by correlating these two variables, I wanted to see whether there was a relationship between string color and string function. So if we first of all look at um, the color of string represented in the data set, we can see that over half um, of the artifacts, 55%, which, because it's 100 uh, artifacts, 55 artifacts, um, were made from natural or unbleached thread. And this isn't, an unexpected result at all. Um, these are fibers in more or less their natural state. They require less processing. So it's very common that they're gonna be used in a variety of um, different contexts. And the second most commonly represented color in my data set was red. So this was really interesting to see and very pleasing since my hunch appeared to be correct. Um, so we have 20% of the data set that features red string and it's red string on its own. So the only string in these artifacts is the color red. So after that, we can see um, artifacts um, here. So 15%, which have more than one color string in them. So I've called these mixed within the, um, within the graph. However, within this mixed group, 10 of those 15 artifacts do also have red present in them alongside a different color. So if we take that into account, 
we can actually see that red is used in nearly a third of all objects in my data set. So this is showing a clear preference for natural colored string followed by red. And we can see that all other colors are represented at much lower levels. So if we move on to look um, at the function of the same artifacts, so we find that over half of these objects are items of personal adornment. So we're talking things like strings of beads for necklaces um, or bracelets. And after that use, the next most common um, is string being used in artifacts as either a handle or a tie. So that's 22%. And after that, 13%, we've got um, funerary uses. So objects that um, formed either part of the preparation of the body or objects that were specifically used in burial. So these are essentially basically um, mainly burial tapes, which were especially made to hold the shroud in place around um, a dead body in burial. Um, and also elements of um, floral wreaths uh, or garlands of flowers, things that were used to adorn the body in death. Now the least common um, use is repair. So that's my descriptor there means string that's been used to mend a broken object. So that's only 2% of the data set. So these figures again are not particularly surprising. The context for most of the artifacts um, that have been excavated from Egypt and are now in the Petrie Museum are cemeteries. So this means naturally we're gonna have a lot of objects that are associated with the body. So items of personal adornment, or items um, associated with the burial process. So that's naturally why they're gonna be really well represented in this data set. When I compared the function and the color of the string in the data set, I saw that natural string was used um, at consistently similar levels across all these different artifact types. So there's no apparent preference for naturally colored string in specific use contexts within this data set. However, when we make the same comparison with red threads in artifacts, um, sorry, uh, if we make the same comparison with red thread, we find that there is a significant preference. Um, and that's a red thread in artifacts of personal adornment. So that's 64% of the data set is red thread used in personal adornment. After that, we've got 20%, which is funerary uses. So red string used um, for funerary artifacts. We're only finding that handles and ties are around 3% of the red artifacts. Um, and that's quite notable because that's one of the um, most well-represented use contexts for natural thread. So it's, it's going kind of the other direction when we're looking at the red string. Similarly, we don't have any examples of red thread being used for repair within this data set. And we could also reframe funerary use of string um, as another kind of bodily adornment. So we're talking about adorning the body in death rather than in life. Um, and if we do this and combine this use with personal adornment, then in fact, we're seeing red string is used in 84% of artifacts. And that's relating to bodily adornment. So we are seeing a clear preference for red thread in artifacts associated with the body. Furthermore, it seems that there is um, a clear uh, link between red string and, uh, and its role within visual display. So it's something that you're meant to be seeing. So we can look at a couple of specific examples of red string artifacts here just to illustrate that. So we've got here um, strings of beads that were either parts of necklaces um, or perhaps bracelets. So on the right, we have um, a small part, stretch of um, red string um, between beads and it's been purposefully exposed. It's very visible and it's got decorative, and decorative knots as well, which adds to its appearance. Contrast that with the use of the string on the left. So we can see this is natural string that's been used to um, create a string of beads. And we can see that it is simply, um, the purpose of the string is simply to carry the beads. It's not intended to be seen. The only reason we can see that bit of string there is because a bead has broken and been lost from it. So it's a very practical use of this color string. It's just there 
as a function to carry the beads. So we're seeing the red string is therefore clearly a visual element. So now we need to wonder and ask um, why the color red at all? So we need to question um, whether it's a choice firstly for technological reasons. So we need to think about the production of red in comparison to other colors. So red dye was produced in Egypt from a variety of different plants, including madda. So that's um, the roots that you can see here on the So that was introduced to Egypt in the 18th dynasty and other plants, including safflower, henna and alkanet. We also find mineral ochre was used to create a red stain on organic materials. And there were also um, insect dye. So um, insects of the genus Kermes, which are down here on the right. And um, they were also used to create a red dye. So much like we might think of cochineal, the red dye um, that might be more familiar to us in modern times. So these insects were found across the Mediterranean. They were traded extensively as a dye stuff and it produced a really vivid crimson color. So we can see that there's a lot of um, possible um, plants and other materials that can be used to create red dye um, in Roman and late antique Egypt. Despite this, however, we do know that other dyes were extensively used to create a range of colors. So on the left, we've got the Stockholm papyrus. Um, so this is a document um, from fourth century Thebes in Egypt, and it lists a variety of different recipes for different colored dyes. So it attests the colors such as dark yellow, leek green, dark blue, rose, Sicilian purple, all kinds of variations of tone and color. So there was a lot of different um, colors available to people producing colored string, textiles, um, fiber um, within this period. And we only need to think of the really vibrant Coptic textiles that are in a lot of museum collections to understand the range of color available. So we don't, it doesn't seem that red was chosen um, as a, for a techno technological reason, rather it seems to be a specific preference. But before we can say that with certainty, we also um, need to consider preservation. So red is well known um, for being one of the most color fast dyes. Um, so it lasts um, a lot longer and it survives in a variety of different conditions better than other colored dyes. So for example, flavonoids, these are um, plant dyes that um, create various yellows, tannin based blacks, and there's also dye woods, which are used to create blues and blacks. These are all colors that are much more prone to degradation compared to red dye. So looking at the material from the Petri Museum, the artifacts that are within my data set are mainly wool or their linen fibers, and that really helps color to persist on them. So for example, if they were made mainly of cotton, that would be more likely to fade. So that's across all um, colors, not just red. Um, also, the majority of the artifacts that we've been looking at here, um, as I said before, are excavated from burial contexts. So they would be protected from the elements to a certain extent and protected from UV light. And then once we're in the museum at the Petrie um, Museum collection, um, the artifacts are stored away in boxes, um, within drawers, they're very, most of the Roman material isn't on display. So that means we're limiting the amount of UV damage. So it doesn't seem that the red we're seeing is um, due to survival, whether it's a kind of, because of its preservation, it does seem to be that it is a chosen preference. People are choosing to use red dye more than other colors for these specific artifacts. So, Keeping that in mind, then we need to turn to cultural reasons for this apparent preference for red. So this is when we find some quite interesting evidence. So we see from a variety of textual evidence that red was associated with very specific meanings and beliefs. And this was, um, these were meanings and beliefs not only in Roman and late antique Egypt, but also earlier in dynastic Egypt and in the Hellenistic period, as well as later into um, the Christian period of Egypt as well. 
So if we look to native Egyptian traditions, we see that red was considered as powerful for both good and evil. In dynastic Egypt, it's significant within magic, and there's many spells that record the use of red-coloured materials. We also find red stones are often favoured for amulets, um, and was a, it seemed to be specifically associated with the goddess Isis. So here we have one example of um, an, an amulet made out of a red stone. It's a tet um, knot, which is associated with uh, Isis. And in fact, Isis and the goddess was often depicted wearing red or a red belt as well. So there does seem to be a correlation there. Looking later, we see in the Greek magical papyri, um, there's red cloth and even red dung being used within the casting of spells um, of different types. And moving forward to Roman um, and especially early Christian traditions, we see red again is especially important. So it's being used in spells um, and it's referenced as well by the late antique writer Marcellus Empiricus. He suggests inserting red wool into the ear as a cure for earache. Um, but perhaps most significantly for the kinds of um, artefacts for the red string that we've been looking at in the Petrie Museum is a quote from the fourth century cleric and writer John Chrysostom. So he explicitly condemns the wearing of red string as amulets. So this is a quote from one of his homilies. And he says, what should we say about the amulets and the bells which are hung, up, hung upon the hand and the scarlet woof and the other things full of extreme folly? The thread and the woof and the other amulets of that kind are entrusted with the child's safety. And then it goes on to say that they, these people should be entrusting their child's safety only with the image of the cross or the symbol of the cross. So in this quote, um, so the translation, um, the word that's been has been translated to woof. So that is a word that refers specifically to the weft threads on a weaving loom. So we're definitely talking about thread or wool. So we can see just from this um, quote alone that red string is being worn to protect the wearer and especially children being mentioned um, in this textual extract. And this is a behaviour that's also recorded um, earlier in the second century by Clement of Alexandria. So this is, appears to be quite a long cultural tradition for this specific practice. So at this point, I'm going to return to some of the artifacts um, from the Petrie Museum. And I think these are artifacts that correspond to the description by John Chrysostom. So what we've got here is a pair of what appear to be bracelets. They're made from plied red cord, um, but they're very dirty. So when you look at them um, in person in the museum, between the cracks in the dirt, there's really vivid red underneath. So you can just see a little bit of it there. And each of these bracelets is decorated with a brown and white striped seashell. We find that each piece of string is securely knotted together to create a loop that's approximately four centimeters in diameter. So these seem to be clearly sized um, for the wrists of a very small child. And these bracelets come from a burial context. So this is from the cemetery sites. Um, so these um, envelopes were generally used to record, um, to store material that came from cemetery excavations. So these are really common within the Petri Museum collection. And we can see the text on it, it suggests it's a cemetery. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to read what that says. So I'm not entirely sure of the site. So in all likelihood, it seems that there was a child who was buried wearing these red bracelets. And if we think back to the textual um, evidence, it seems that they would have had a specifically protected, protective or amuletic purpose. And then we've got more material that seems to tell a similar story. So here we've got on the left, is, this is a glass multicolored bead um, and it's strung onto a very short piece of red thread. So the length of the thread is approximately seven centimeters from one end to the other. Um, and so again, it seems like it could be sized for a very small child or a baby's wrist. And then here on the right, um, we've got a piece of very thick, it's quite loosely spun, um, bright red wool. And on it is suspended um, a copper alloy pendant. 
So the length of the wall, um, it's fastened just with a single knot. It can be difficult to kind of tell from this photograph. Um, it's approximately seven centimetres, um, which means that it could be suitable either um, as a necklace or perhaps as a bracelet that's been wrapped around the wrist more than once. <clears throat> And then also within the Petrie Museum, we've got um, these two artifacts here. So on the left, um, we've got a double looped piece of red dyed string um, fastened again with a knot. And on it is suspended a cross pendant and it's been cast in lead. And it's the style of that um, cross, which dates the artifact to between the seventh and the 10th century AD. So this was um, excavated from the cemetery at Cal. So it's one of the better um, documented artifacts we've got. Um, the fact that it comes from Cal means that it's likely to be dated to um, the earlier end of this spectrum. So likely nearer the seventh century rather than the 10th. So this object has got a diameter of approximately seven centimeters. So that might be suitable for an adult size wrist. And that object, because it's quite complete, is also useful in helping us identify what might be happening here in the partial artifact on the right of the screen. So again, we've got a lead cross um, suspended on a fragment of red um, woolen thread. So presumably this is an incomplete version of the uh, bracelet on the left. So we're seeing that it appears as a discrete group of artifacts that's forming here. We've got red thread amuletic jewellery that seems to have been worn by both adults and children. And the protective power of these lengths of red string or wool is also enhanced sometimes by the beads or the pendants with which they've been combined. So, as I said a moment ago, John Chrysostom's um, homily goes on to say that instead of these bits of red thread, parents should only be protecting their children with the symbol of the cross. So that would suggest that these symbols are themselves protective and amuletic. So you're kind of combining, it's quite syncretic, this um, use of different types of material. And we've also got another example which shows um, red thread being combined with um, the symbol of the evil eye so here we have, um, these are known as crumb beads, which um, dates this artifact to the late Roman period. So here we've got this crumb bead attached to a length of uh, red string. And the, e the eye motif here is um, a circle of opaque white glass with a blue pupil. And this is a common motif that was used throughout late antiquity to repel the ev evil or envious eye. Um, and it's something that might be familiar from the modern Mediterranean today. So places like Turkey, you still see those sorts of eye motifs as a protective um, kind of protective design. So we can see from this analysis, analysis of red string artifacts that we can identify specific behaviors in Roman and especially late antique Egypt. And that's namely the wearing of organic jewelry in the form of red threads as a magical form of protecting oneself from harm. So what's also interesting um, and leads on from this is the use of red on funerary objects. So many of the objects I've shown you um, were originally worn in life um, and then used to dress the body for burial. However, I want to quickly consider um, artifacts that were made explicitly for a burial context. So here we've got an example of some of the burial tapes I mentioned earlier, and this is from the Petrie Museum. So these are with, um, it's all under one accession number. So the, it's these red um, braided tapes. We've also got some here in a natural color, but red is the most common. So the practice of using these kinds of burial tapes um, dates from the second to the seventh centuries AD. And there's tapes that have been excavated from a site called Fag el Gamus in Egypt. Um, and those tests show that the red on these um, is a stain rather than a dye. And it's a stain made with red ochre mineral. So that tells us it was never designed to be washed. Um, it wasn't color fast in that sense, and it wasn't intended to be reused. So that really supports the fact that they were used specifically within the burial process. 
So the colour, the presence of um, this red colour on burial tapes, as well as the red jewellery that adorned the body in burial, would afford the deceased protection in their journey in death to the afterlife, along with the other red jewellery that they were wearing within daily life. However, it's clear that um, from the artefacts that we were looking at within the Petrie Museum, that um, these sorts of behaviours are not restricted to red string as an amuletic phenomenon. So as my work um, continued on organic artefacts in the museum's collection, I started to spot further examples of red objects and trends that were recognisable from this initial study. So after looking at um, original string, I had turned to shoes as a discrete artefact type within the Petrie collection. So the museum um, has got an excellent range of shoes and sandals in various states of preservation. Um, but as with many of the Roman and late antique artefacts held there, they've been understudied compared to material from the earlier dynastic periods. So again, I created a data set. So this time the data set was formed of 89 shoes from the Petrie Museum. Oh, so 89 shoes in total. Um, and then this was supplemented again with material from the British Museum and also from the V&A. So I recorded the main types of decoration um, that were present on the shoes. So we had 59 shoes in total, um, which had been decorated using one or more different techniques. And we found that the use of red was the most popular type of decoration present. So you can see here, for example, we've got a partial shoe um, and the body of it is red leather. <clears throat> After red, um, the most popular was tooled or cut leather decoration. So the sorts of um, embossing, um, patterns that have been um, incised into the leather, leather, such as on the right, top right there. The least uh, popular type of decoration was decorative stitching. So this is um, a shoe from the British Museum. Um, there was a couple of shoes that looked similar to this, but this was not something that appeared within the Petrie Museum. <clears throat> And we've also got gilding as well. So we can see that present here and also on this pair of shoes from the V&A in the bottom, uh, bottom right. So other than the color of gold and gilded um, details and the browns of tanned leather, red is really the only color that we're seeing being used on these shoes. And that excludes uh, a single example of a maroon pair of shoes, which is bottom right. And these appear to be quite unusual. So again, we're seeing a significant preference for red, um, but this time on footwear from Roman Egypt. So it's quite familiar. And we're seeing red being incorporated in a number of different ways. So there was a lot of um, plant fiber shoes within the Petrie Museum collection. Um, and we're seeing red elements using red dyed plant material to create borders or trims around the soles um, of a sandal on their, the upper side of them, so where you place your foot on top. And these were also used to create patterns across the sole itself, so you can see here on the top right. And we also see red um, present on the strappings of shoes. And this is quite interesting because often um, these straps that go across no longer exist. You're only left with fragments like this. However, um, if you turn them over, you can often find the stubs of these straps. And you can see here that whilst the straps no longer exist, we can see that there was originally a red dyed plant material used to decorate them. So without that little telltale sign, we might think that there was no color used on this shoe at all, whereas that's not the case. And then, as I mentioned a moment ago, there's also examples where the entire body of the shoe or sandal um, has been uh, coloured red. So a couple of great examples here. <clears throat> so we've got 
On the right, um, a pair of um, sandals, and um, these are composite sandals. So they appear to have a leather upper and um, tread sole. And then in the middle um, is a sandwich of um, what appears to be papyrus or other plant material. And then the shoe on the left um, is like a leather slipper and it's got kind of really lovely incised decoration. So if we think back to um, the use of red um, for amuletic string bracelets, it does seem likely, I think, that the use of red on shoes is also part of this broader tradition. And this is something that is supported by um, other research that's been conducted. So if we look at the work of a variety of clothing researchers, um, they've shown that red was used extensively on adult and children's clothing. So the dress specialist, Faith Pennock Morgan, has demonstrated that red was used often as a trim on tunics, so around the neckline specifically, and also the cuffs. So it appears to have been used to protect the entrances to a garment. And this is especially true for um, clothing for children. Similarly, um, the work of Tinaka Ruyakas um, has investigated the use of single red threads that have been woven into tunics from the late antique period. And this appears to have also been a method to afford the wearer protection. So you can see um, just there in that example, a single red thread that's been woven into a, into a tunic. So we're seeing the use of red on clothing as well attested um, for protective purposes. And of course, um, we can't talk about this without mentioning the magnificent pair of uh, red socks that are in the v um, originally from late antique Egypt. So again, we're seeing the use of red on feet. And on the left um, is a great um, picture of them in use. Um, so this is a portrait um, of a woman wearing a very similar pair of red socks. This is from a burial shroud um, from second century Egypt. So it's not really a stretch too much of the imagination um, that the use of red on socks and shoes and sandals corresponds to the magical protective qualities of the color. If we think of um, the nature of um, feet, <laughs> they are the body's main point of contact with the ground. Um, the feet um, can be considered a liminal zone and um, requiring protection from pollution and the attentions of evil spirits. Traditional medical thought of the period um, was that the human body was at risk from these external pollutants and that these pollutants could enter the body and upset its equilibrium. So these ideas we, we find in Plato and Euripides. And additionally, in a, just a practical sense, shoes represent protection because they keep the feet safe from dangers on the ground. So that's something like stones, thorns, rogue insects, um, and this is especially important in a period when minor injuries could cause life-threatening Ill illnesses. So when we keep that in mind, the presence of red on shoes appears to logically correspond to the use of this colour as an important means of protection throughout the lives of people in Roman and in late antique Egypt. So it had an important practical as well as aesthetic function, function and was a significant cultural practice. So I'll just finish up with a few conclusions. Um, so I hope that I've shown that the preference for the color red in artifacts um, of personal adornment um, is visible within the Petrie Museum collection and that this color had a special significance, specifically that it was valued for its protective powers. And this is, something that appears to be clear from textual evidence, um, which corresponds with the sorts of artifacts that we find within the Petrie Museum collection. Furthermore, whilst the evidence that we've looked at dates to the Roman and late antique periods, um, it seems that this behavior may have been part of a broader cultural tradition that began much earlier. Also, I think it's fair to say it likely extended beyond the confines of Egypt. So John Chrysostom, who we had a quote from earlier, he was Bishop of Constantinople. Marcellus Empiricus, the writer who had a solution for earache, um, he was from Gaul. Um, 
And then obviously Clement of Alexandria is from Egypt. So we're seeing um, a, a tradition that might have been across the Roman world more broadly. And that, I think, um, is quite an interesting point. Egypt in the Roman period um, is often set apart as a place of difference in terms of culture. Um, it can be difficult to use it um, as representative of the empire as a whole. But I think that perhaps the evidence from the Petra Museum suggests without wanting to homogenize provinces that perhaps the differences during this period are less stark than is often suggested. I think it might be that the difference is in fact the unusual survivals of organic materials from Egypt um, that don't exist elsewhere and that's what can heighten the sense of difference within the archaeological record. Finally I hope I've shown um, the value that these older museum collections have despite the complicated nature of their object histories and collecting practices. And it's clear that despite in some cases artifacts lacking basic contextual details, that we can focus on the material nature of artifacts, in particular organic artifacts, um, and that they can make important contributions to our knowledge of Roman and late antique artifacts and society more broadly. Thank you. Thank you.